Bilingualism is the illiteracy of the 21st century. This statement was made in a recent report by the British Academy. The report calls for action to address the shortage of language skills in the UK. More recently, in a report with sister academies in Australia and Canada, the British Academy highlights the crucial role multilingualism plays in international collaboration to fight COVID-19 through being able to exchange information accurately. So why learn a language? Learning a new language opens a window to another culture. It broadens our mental horizons. It enhances our creativity. Languages are important for economic prosperity. The economic cost due to UK's linguistic underperformance in terms of lost trade and investment has been estimated to 48 billion pounds per year or 3.5% of GDP. Multilingualism has also become important for the individual as non-English online content, content uh, increases continually. And yet, many people find learning a second language a daunting task. Why is that? After all, we seem to have learned our mother tongue or native language almost without effort. When we are babies, our parents, siblings, carers speak to us, we slowly start replying to them. And before we know it, most of our native language is in place before we even get to go to school. Why learning a second language later in life seems so difficult? Do we lose our knack for languages? I would like to explain how our linguistic mind guides the process of second language learning and how uh, adjusting our teaching to the native languages of different learners can have an impact on their learning. There are many aspects in learning a second language that are different from how we learned our mother tongue. One key difference is how much language data we get to work with. Unlike our loving family providing us with language data 24 hours per day, seven days a week when we are babies, when we get to learn a second language, we might only have access to a few hours of uh, foreign language classes per week in a school. But even when we do get to work with plenty of data, uh, learning progresses differently. I am a living example of this. I have been living in UK for 27 years, studying and then working, using English every single day over these years, in real life situations. And yet, there are small aspects of English that I still struggle to get right. Do you arrive at Paris or in Paris? Um, see you at the weekend or see you in the weekend? Of course, these mistakes are not crucial for my everyday communication. In fact, a lot of learners achieve high mastery in their second language without ever sounding native. But it is a curious fact how after so many years of using the language every day and living in UK, I still struggle with some aspects of English. So what is different in our mind? One key difference is that we come to learn a second language already knowing one. Imagine you visit a country where you speak no word of the local language. What do you do? Where would you start? You would probably reach out for a dictionary looking for translations of words. So you start with words. Why? What do words do? Words link small pieces of language with concepts like uh, table, tiger, big, small, fear, freedom. Concepts we use every day to organize the knowledge of our world. Mapping your concepts to new words in your new language uh, seems like an obvious first step to take to get going. And it can be fast. But of course, we don't just speak in lists of words. We group and organize words into sentences. 
When we hear a sentence, we assign abstract structure to it. To see this, consider the example. I saw the girl with the binoculars. Who has the binoculars? Is it the girl or is it me? It could be either. So we get two possible meanings out of one string of words, one sentence. How do we get two possible meanings out of one sentence? When we hear a sentence, the first step is to break the continuous stream of sound into words. The next step is to group these words into sentences. This job is done by our syntax parser. It is our parser that in the earlier example groups together binoculars with a speaker or binoculars with a girl. We apply unconsciously and constantly our parser when we speak. One interesting property of our syntax parser is that it can take uh, small, simple sentences and put them together to make longer sentences. For example, it can take the sentence, you ate the chocolates, and put it together with the sentence, mom gave me chocolate for my lunchbox, to create the longer sentence, you ate the chocolate mom gave me for my lunchbox. It sounds like a very ordinary sentence, yet we call such sentences complex ones because they take up much more memory space and require more brain power to process. And yet we use them all the time without effort. Now, the core mechanics of our parser are universal across all human languages. What this means is that we can use our syntax parser from our native language to process sentences in our second language. This then allows us to understand and produce basic and complex sentences in our second language at a remarkably fast rate. We linguists are very interested in complex sentences because they're a good measure of learners advancing proficiency. One good way to study complex sentences is by investigating learner writings. Online learning platforms accessed daily by thousands of learners can provide us with unprecedented amounts of learner writings. I have worked with the Online School of Education First, an international school of English as a foreign language. Together, we have built a unique corpus of writing submitting to EF's online school. The corpus is open access, making available to the research community 1.2 million scripts from learners from all around the world across different proficiency levels. Analyzing this corpus material, we find very quickly that learners use complex sentences right from the beginning of their learning. Let's take a look at this graph. The horizontal axis uh, maps proficiency to the Common European Framework of Reference, or CFR for short. Uh, A1 is beginner levels and C1 is advanced proficiency. Uh, to give you some context for these bands, the Home Office would require B1 proficiency to grant you citizenship, while for entry to a UK university you would normally uh, need a C1 qualification. The vertical axis shows the percentage of complex sentences in learner writings. Uh, to calculate this measure of linguistic complexity, we use natural language processing technology, uh, which provides us with a machine parser that can extract the complex sentences out of the learner writings automatically. As you can see, learners use complex sentences right from beginner levels, increasing as their learning progresses. What makes this interesting is that many teachers and textbooks consider complex sentences difficult, and so they won't start teaching them before intermediate levels B1, B2. So this is an example showing how important it is for our teaching to reflect what we know about uh, the learner internal processes. 
In this case, it would mean uh, introducing the learners to aspects of complex sentences while they're still at beginner levels. You may wonder, if we can bring so much is to our second language learning through our syntax parser from our native language and our knowledge of the world, how is it possible that so many people feel that learning a second language is such a difficult task? This is because languages can be very similar at their core, but they can also be very diverse and worlds apart in some very important ways. Learning gets difficult when you encounter in your second language small bits of words, small bits of structure that are different from your native language or even non-existent. Uh, these small bits of structure or forms are often uh, perceived as insignificant, but in fact getting them wrong might even distort the message you tr are trying to convey. Let's look at some examples. Imagine a learner hearing the following phrases. I'm loving it. I love it. I loved it. I am leaving tomorrow. So in the first three, one, three th phrases, there is a common part, love, uh, which the learner might easily grasp the meaning of. After all, love is a universal concept. But what about the other small bits? You might easily grasp that love, loving is about now and I loved is about the past. Uh, but what about the difference between I love it and I'm loving it? Is the contrast about the intensity of love, its duration, how permanent it is? Your native language cannot be any help here. Uh, things get even trickier because it seems that these small elements can change meaning depending on context. For example, I'm loving it is about now, but I'm living tomorrow is about tomorrow, it's going to happen tomorrow. So these small bits of structure and word bits are very difficult for learners for many reasons. They are small and difficult to hear, and we know that at early stages of acquisition, learners have difficulty noticing them and processing them. So even though they are abundant uh, in the language data learners get to hear, learners don't process them, and if they don't process them, they cannot learn them. A key factor to how well learners are going to do with these uh, small bits of uh, language depends on the similarity between their mother tongue and the second language, what we call the linguistic distance between the mother tongue and the second language. In fact, a recent study looking at learning Dutch as a foreign language has demonstrated that the, learn the linguistic distance uh, between the learner's mother tongue and their second language can even predict their scores in speaking proficiency tests. Let's take a look at an example. In English, when we say, I walked to the park, this small d at the end of walk uh, tells us that the walking happened in the past, not now, not in the future. So English changes the form of words to, sh to, to show when things happen. Every language has a way of indicating when different events happen, but not all languages do this by changing the form of their words. Let's look at the Chinese example. Uh, here we have the sentence, go to dinner with mother, uh, happening at three different times, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. As we can see in the English translation, we have two versions of the word go, depending on when the going uh, takes place. The corresponding word in uh, Chinese, qi, remains unchanged. This means that Chinese learners are very likely to say, yesterday I walked to the park, so not uh, mark the tense of, on the verb walk by adding the small element d. Uh, small words like a uh, and the are equally problematic for learners. For example, if you're a Brazilian learner, you're much more likely to overuse the definite article there. Let's take a look at uh, the example uh, of a writing of an intermediate Brazilian learner. Uh, as you can see, this learner is quite articulate with her language, but yet uh, keeps getting the definite article wrong throughout this piece. How can we help learners overcome such confusions? 
Well, we need in our teaching to consider the way their native language influences their learning. One good way to do this is to focus on the way our brain processes language data and help learners process those difficult bits of structure and figure out their meaning. In our research, we adopt the input processing instruction method, a method developed by the American linguist Bill Van Patten. We combine input processing instruction with learner profiles based on the native languages of the learners to develop learning activities. The key idea is to get learners to process those difficult bits of structure that they tend to ignore because they can rely on other information. For example, we take away helpful words like yesterday, tomorrow, every day, once in a while, and ask learners to tell us if a sentence like I walked across the beach is about something that happened in the past or will happen in the future, whether it's an event that might have been repeated, was a habit or ongoing. The key idea here is that this small d element in walked is only compatible with some of those meanings. And research shows that once learners start processing these small elements and figure out their meaning, uh, the accuracy of their language uh, improves greatly. Now, these grammar processing activities can uh, happen uh, very easily online and support blended learning. Uh, they can be very helpful for enhancing the language skills of immigrant kids to ensure equality and uh, make classrooms inclusive and cohesive, grammar processing activities addressing the individual needs of learners can be offered in addition to classroom tasks, for instance, online. Classroom time then can focus on tasks that engage all learners uh, with meaningful language use, providing varied and rich input that is essential for language learning. This is just one practical example of how this new approach to second language learning can make a difference. Of course, this applies for every individual learner, uh, untangling the networks of our linguistic mind is our learner's guide to acquiring and mastering new languages. Understanding these learner internal processes and tuning our learning to them is essential. Everyone's native language is their own personal key to unlocking bilingualism and beyond. Thank you very much.